Uh, so welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we're very lucky to have Fawn Lee from Yale, who's going to tell us about propensity score weighting for covariate adjustment and randomized uh, clinical trials. Uh, we're also very lucky to have uh, a discussant with us today, Kerry Locke Morgan from uh, Penn State University. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to switch over to Guillaume, who's going to tell you about how we take questions. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as usual, questions will be hand, uh, handled through the Q&A. So we're very lucky to have Fan and Shushi today, who will be uh, answering your questions in the Q&A um, live. Um, if, uh, so from time to time, we will pause and ask questions uh, directly to Fan. Um, so please, again, uh, th these questions will be selected from the Q&A. So ask your questions there, and we'll select a few of them. If your question is selected, I will ask you to raise your hand and unmute you. So please don't raise your hand um, unless I've asked you to do so. And uh, again, thank you everyone for uh, coming, uh, you know, making it uh, during uh, Thanksgiving week. We really appreciate that. And uh, Fan, uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I don't think I, um, Michael, can you, could yeah. you give me permission to share? Oh. Sounds good, there we go, thank you. Um, Thanks again, Michael and Gilliam. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here and um, talk about propensity score weighting for um, covariate adjustment, which concerns a common practice in um, randomized trials. This is joint work with Shu Shi Zhen, who is a graduate student at Duke University and Ray Wen from Harvard, as well as um, senior fan from Duke. Um, randomized controlled trials serves as the gold standard for evaluating the efficacy and safety of new interventions. Um, it balances both the um, the, the measured and unmeasured confounders and expectation and ensures the optimal internal validity for comparisons, which justifies the difference in means estimator um, as an unbiased estimator for the intervention effect. Oftentimes, we also collect um, patient level characteristics at baseline in these studies, um, but due to a single randomization and perhaps also limited sample size, the chance imbalance could often occur for these covariates, which may um, impact the phase validity of the trial um, in a sense that it appears that randomization, randomization doesn't really um, do its job, as well as affecting its um, the, 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 the subsequent statistical analysis in terms of the efficiency and in power. Um, as a simple example, we look at the table one, the usual table one in standard clinical paper. Um, for the um, best air RCT, the best um, appear intervention research RCT, which evaluates the effect of continuous positive airway pressure, the CPAP intervention, on the health outcomes for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the trial doesn't have a large sample size. We only have about 170 people for randomization into two groups. Um, and um, in this table, we can see that randomization balances um, most of the covariates um, between the two groups, except for the baseline systolic blood pressure, as well as the baseline of near hypopnea index. Um, for both of these covariates, it appears that in the control group, the average value of these covariates are higher than um, the intervention, the, the CPAP group. And so ignoring these um, imbalances may, um, um, may, 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 may have some consequences in the downstream analysis in terms of the um, validity as well as the statistical efficiency um, for the intervention effect. So there are two mainstream approaches for adjusting for covariates in, in randomized trial. And um, a common way to do so is to perform regression adjustment via the analysis of the covariance, the ANCOVA approach. Um, and in this approach, we model the outcome as a function of the treatment centered covariates as well as their interactions. And one can read off the coefficient of the treatment variable as an adjusted um, estimator for the intervention effect in randomized trials. And these adjusted um, estimator often improves power over the unadjusted estimator. And under some conditions, we can show that um, this ANCOVA estimator is asymptotically equivalent to the most efficient estimator among a semi-parametric class of estimators. And even under model misspecification, in a sense that um, the covariates um, enter, the, the functional forms of the covariates are misspecified, the ANCOVA estimator is still unbiased um, 
um, not only that, but also the model-based variance can also be valid um, um, if the allocation is balanced, which is shown in a recent paper. However, misspecification of the outcome model can decrease the precision in unbalanced experiments when we have unbalanced allocations um, and also in, in the presence of strong um, treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, using regression approaches that also invites, a, that, that also has a potential for inviting a fishing expedition in a sense that one may search for a outcome model that um, presents the most dramatic treatment effect estimates, um, thus, jeopardizing, thus jeopardizes the objectivity in, in causal inference with randomized trials. Um, even so, um, ANCOVA models are still most commonly used in, in biomedical studies. Um, alternatively, the inverse probability weighting is an objective uh, alternative to the ANCOVA models in analyzing randomized control trials. Um, using IPW, we model the known treatment assignment mechanism um, as a function of the baseline covariates, and we create the usual inverse propensity score weights and then use the difference in the weighted mean outcomes between groups um, as an estimator for the intervention effect in RCTs. In um, randomized trials, the assignment mechanism is controlled by the investigator. And so the propensity score model is always considered correctly specified and hence justifies the unbiasedness of this IPW estimator in um, randomized trials for covariate adjustment. Um, the advantage of this IPW approach as documented in the literature is that it separates the design and analysis without involving outcome in the design stage. Um, and we can imagine a situation where the propensity score weights are created by one analyst and then the other analyst will carry out analysis based on only the propensity score weights but without access to any covariates. Um, and thus um, avoids the fishing expedition by promoting objectivity in pre-specifying the analytical adjustment. Um, the IPW approach also avoids potential convergence issues with regression under rare outcomes, for example, with rare but um, Bernoulli outcomes or, or binary outcomes. We, we would not have to do um, log binomial regression models to estimate um, risk ratios, um, which we know could uh, be prone to um, non-convergence issues. The limitation of IPW, however, is that it may be inefficient compared to ANCOVA with a limited sample size and also unbalanced um, treatment allocations. And then because of that, we propose to weight beyond inverse probability weighting or IPW for covariate adjustment in our CTs. We wish to maintain the objectivity of weighting, but possibly could improve the finite sample performance of IPW for adjustment. Um, to do so, we introduce the usual notation where we write n as the total sample size. We let z denote the randomized treatment indicator taking values 0 and 1, depending on the assignment we observe. We write y1, y0 as potential outcomes under treatment and control, and we let x denote um, a, a list of the recorded baseline covariates um, in the trial. And we are interested in the additive causal estimate as usual, the ATE estimate defined as the expectation of Y1 minus Y0 over the study population. We maintain a usual assumption of the stable unit treatment value condition where we link the observed outcome Y to the potential outcomes. And we assume randomization, which um, says that the randomization of the treatment assignment Z does not depend on the covariates nor the potential outcomes, and we denote this R as the proportion of the individuals being randomized to intervention. Most typically, this R value equals to one half, indicating a, um, a balanced assignment. So we have equal proportion um, um, of individuals randomized into treatment or control, but other values can also be possible with perceived benefit of the treatment. In some cases, when we consider the treatment to be beneficial for ethical reasons, we may have a larger value um, of R um, compared to one half. Under these conditions, um, the ATE parameter tau can easily be identified by the difference in the conditional expectation between the two groups, which motivates the usual unadjusted difference in means estimator. Um, to make some possible improvement by using weighting procedures, we recognize that ATE is a special case of a class of the weighted average treatment effect, the weight estimate, 
Um, and um, to define that, we write the conditional average treatment effect as tau of x, and we assume the density of the observed covariates fx in the study sample exist. We consider a target population denoted by the density g of x, which can possibly be different from the observed density fx. And then we write hx as a ratio between gx over fx. And we call that function hx a tilting function, which can reweight um, my study population represent the target population of interest. Um, by the above elements, we can define the class of estimates, um, the class of the estimates, um, um, which is the ATE over a new target population G, which we call tau of H, um, to specifically acknowledge the linkage of this estimate to the tilting function. And we can express that um, as a ratio of these two expectations here. Um, and then evidently, when the H function is proportional to a constant, um, the observed density coincide with the target density. And the target population is basically the observed population. And that this weight estimate um, becomes the usual ATE. Varying values of the tilting function can vary the target population. And in practice, most commonly in observational studies, we could pre-specify the value of the tilting function as a function of the true propensity score to, uh, to target um, alternative target populations. But under randomization, the value of the true propensity score is a constant. And as long as um, the tilting function is a function of the true propensity score, different forms of the tilting function can correspond to the same target population. And the weight estimate simply becomes the ATE. And the, the special feature um, in the last slide under randomized control trials provides the basis for using alternative weighting strategies to achieve better finite sample performances in, in covariate adjustment for RCTs. And specifically for a given value of the tilting function, if we want to estimate that weight estimate, we can use the following balancing weights, which gives each individual um, receiving intervention a weight being proportional to the ratio between the tilting function and the true propensity score. And we give a weight to each individual in the control group um, as the ratio between the tilting function over one minus the propensity score. We call this class of weights the balancing weights because they could balance the distributions of the weighted covariates between the two arms towards a common target population G. Um, and then we can use the Hayek type estimator of the weight to estimate the class of estimates um, um, as usual. And we can choose the weight to be inverse probability weights, um, which is a common practice, or we can use um, overlap weights, which gives um, each individual receiving treatment a weight equal to one minus um, the propensity score, the propensity to receive the control um, condition. Um, and then we give the weight to each individual in the control condition, the propensity to receive the intervention. Um, among this family, because ATT weights, as well as the matching weights are also special members of the class of the balancing weights, they can also be used um, for covariate adjustment purposes in randomized controlled trials. And just to reiterate, um, the choice, um, although different choices of the tilting function can modify the target population and target estimates, in observational studies, um, they correspond to the same ATE in, in randomized controlled trials, as long as um, the specification of the H function only depends on um, the true propensity score. In observational studies, um, the overlap weights, or OW, correspond to a target population with the most overlap in the baseline covariates. And theoretically, this is shown um, to give the smallest asymptotic variance for the causal contrast. Empirically, there are also an increased number of simulation studies showing that um, we can gain efficiency in, in finite samples by using OW versus IPW. And in RCTs, the true propensity score is a constant. And so OW and IPW actually target the same target estimate, ATE, as we explained before. But their finite sample, but their finite sample operating characteristics can be markedly different. Um, and um, this is the basis from which we consider applying the overlap weights um, to RCTs um, for covariate adjustment purposes. And then we display 
this sample weighting estimator um, here in the slide where EI hat represents um, an, an estimated propensity scores from a working model in, in RCTs. And then in RCTs, um, the working propensity score model is often the logistic regression model um, that, that is the most accessible um, parametric regression models for binary um, outcomes. Um, and we write the theta parameter as the parameter in this propensity score model. And then what goes into the propensity score model for adjustment usually includes um, um, certification variables we use in the design stage, as well as other key prognostic factors we pre-specify in the design stage as well. And the purpose here, um, when we fit this propensity score, um, this working propensity score model is not to learn the assignment mechanism, um, but to implicitly perform adjustment for covariates in RCTs. And so um, in this context, um, perhaps flexible regression models may not be as useful um, as in observational studies. And so we did not consider those flexible models from this point onward. Um, another interesting property of the OW is that um, the overlap weights estimated from the logistic, um, the logistic working model can lead to exact mean balance of any predictor included in the model. Um, in a sense that once we apply the overlap weights to my RCT data, um, I can see that the weighted covariates from the two groups are exactly the same. And that means that the weighted difference in the usual table one are identically zero, which improves um, the phase validity of the trial, showing that the randomization actually worked because we have um, equally, compare, um, e equally comparable treatment and control groups. Um, the exact mean balance property also can translate into better efficiency in the estimation of the ATE parameter in RCTs. And uh, this intuition can be um, illustrated in um, by, by the following example, where we consider a simple additive outcome surface, um, yi um, equal to an overall intercept plus a constant treatment effect plus a covariate effect as well as a mean zero error term here. And then we can decompose the sources of the estimation error for um, common estimators in RCTs as a sum of the weighted chance and balance defined by this delta x over here, which measures um, after weighting how different the covariates are between the two groups, as well as the weighted difference in the noises defined as this delta epsilon um, quantity. Um, in the slide here, which measures how different um, the expected error term would be after weighting. And then the error of the unadjusted estimator clearly um, in a single randomized study will be equal to a linear combination um, of the unweighted um, difference in the covariates as well as the unweighted difference in the error terms. And then this source of error, the first source of error can explode when X is exhibits chance imbalance and the coefficient beta zero becomes large, in which case we know we have some highly prognostic covariates that are unbalanced by randomization. Um, the error of the IPW estimator can be um, decomposed into the sum of a weighted combination, um, um, of, a, of a linear combination of the weighted, of the IP, of the inverse probability weighted um, difference in chance imbalance, as well as the IPW weighted um, um, difference in the noises. And um, this error term is often smaller than the one from the unadjusted estimator because we expect that IPW could reduce the chance imbalance to some degree, um, even not perfectly. And so we expect that um, the error term from the IPW estimator will be smaller in general. In contrast, the estimation error for the OW estimator is actually free of the covariates as well as the coefficient measuring the prognostic value of the covariates because um, the estimation error um, will only depend on um, the, the, the overlap weighted difference in the error terms. Um, and so the value of the beta zero does not affect the estimation error. And so this intuition from a single study um, shows that there could be an ordering of the estimation error among these three estimators. And then the reduced estimation error in a single iteration 
can translate into better efficiency over repeated experiments for the OWS3. We also studied the asymptotic properties um, of the OW estimate in the context of RCTs. Um, and, and to present those results, we first introduced the family of the um, regular and asymptotic linear estimators for ATE um, in, in randomized trials, um, even in this first line over here. And then the first um, two terms are basically the unadjusted estimator, and then um, the latter term concerns an augmentation um, from this first estimator where we write G0x and G1x as two scalar functions of the x's. The, the unadjusted estimate in RCTs corresponds to choosing G, Z, GZ of x um, as basically zero. The NCOVA1 estimator where we regress y to the main effects of the treatment and the main effect of the covariates corresponds to choices of the GZx as the expectation of y even x's. Um, while the NCOVA2 estimator, where we add another interaction between treatment and covariates corresponds to um, choosing GZ of X equals to the conditional expectation of Y, even Z, as well as the Xs. And this approach has been considered to be fully efficient if the outcome model is correctly specified. And also the IPW estimator with the working logistic regression model um, can also be shown to be asymptotically equivalent so the NCOVA2 estimator, when the G, um, GZ of X is linear in the excess, which is the adjustment variable in the, lo in the logistic working um, propensity score. And this has been shown in the prior literature. Um, what we can show is that, um, first of all, if the propensity score is um, estimated by a parametric model that satisfies some conditions, then the OW estimator in RCTs also belongs to the class of the semi-parametric estimators we introduced earlier. And then suppose x1 and x2 are two nested sets of the baseline covariates um, with Ex1 and Ex2 um, as two nested smooth parametric models for the propensity score, corresponding to two OW estimators with the weights coming from these two models. We can then show that the asymptotic variance of the OW estimator with the more saturated propensity score model is no larger than that um, of the, than the asymptotic variance of the OW estimator with the more parsimonious um, working propensity score model. And then finally, with the logistic working propensity score model, the OW estimator is also asymptotically equivalent to the NCOVA2 estimator and is um, um, semi-parametrically efficient as long as the true outcome surface even covariates and given treatment condition is a linear function of the excess, which is the adjustment variable in um, the working logistic propensity score model. And then the previous results extend the results of IPW to OW um, and then um, indicates that adjusting for baseline covariates using OW does not adversely affect um, efficiency in large samples than without adjustment. And to further illustrate the intuition of the second point where we show that the OW estimator with the more um, saturated propensity score model um, is not asymptotically less efficient than the one with a, mo with a more parsimonious uh, propensity score model. Um, we can show that when um, the allocation proportion R equals to one half, the asymptotic variance of the OW estimator is, being pro is, is proportional to the variance of the mean center outcome, y tilde, as well as uh, times one minus the R squared, which measures the proportion of explained variation after regressing this mean center covariate, this mean center outcome to covariates. And then as we include more covariates in the propensity score model, these R squared do not further decrease. Um, and that illustrates the intuition of the second, of the second part of the previous proposition. Um, however, in, in finite samples, because we do not afford to adjust for many covariates, um, it is often encouraged to specify x a priori and specifically to include um, those that exhibit chance imbalance, as well as those with high prognostic values in the design stage. Perhaps more interestingly, we can also show that the previous proposition also holds for the larger family of the balancing weights, as long as the tilting function hx is a smooth function, 
of the true propensity score, um, where the smoothness requires at least differentiability. Um, and in particular, the matching weights as a member of the balancing weights um, is, not any, is not everywhere differentiable. Um, but this proposition still holds. If we smooth over that single non-differentiable point um, when EX equals to one half. Um, for binary outcomes, um, we, can, we, we can still apply the OW um, machinery to estimate um, risk ratio, causal risk ratios, and also causal odds ratios, in addition to the additive causal estimate. Um, and um, we can show, um, as has been done previously for IPW, that OW can improve efficiency over the unadjusted estimate in, our, in RCTs when we estimate these series of racial estimates, um, but with the caveat that OW may have better um, finite sample stability and performance than IPW. Um, for, for inference with OW, we proceed with the usual sandwich variance um, that, um, um, is, um, that, that takes into account for the uncertainty in the estimation of the propensity scores in that logistic working uh, model. And we can summarize the variance estimators of the OW um, approach for each of these estimates, um, both additive and also ratio, concisely in a single variance formula um, where this new one and new two depends on the choices of the target estimates. And then this form of the variance estimator also shed light on the variance production property of the OW relative to the unadjusted um, variances, which is given by the first term in this variance estimator. Um, so I will stop here um, for, for any questions in the middle before we go into the simulation study, um, if we have any questions. Thanks, Fan. So there aren't any questions in the, in the Q&A, um, but um, I do have one question. So um, proposition one is really interesting. So the, um, uh, the point C, I was particularly surprised about that it's um, uh, asymptotically equivalent to ENCOVA2. Um, like, I, I guess where my intuition is, is a bit shaky is that the, um, uh, the uh, overlap weights balance the, mod, the, the covariates, uh, but the margins of the covariates, right? Um, right. But if your if you're ENCOVA2 model has interactions between the, between the covariates, wouldn't that um, uh, technically or potentially lead to more, more precision? Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of um, unclear as to how, uh, I, I don't have strong intuition as to how they can be equivalent given, given that. Yeah, so um, basically what we can show is that once we use either IPW or, so, 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 um, so maybe this is more straightforward in saying that the ENCOVA2 estimator by specifying that interaction terms, we can show that it corresponds to, um, I mean, the influence function of this approach basically says that G0X and G1X equals to the conditional expectation of Y given Xs. Um, given Z equals to Z, right? So it really models the treatment specific outcome surfaces. And then the same um, influence function can be obtained once we specify the weights, like, you know, using IPW or OW. So you can show that they will lead to the same construction of the G0 and G1X, which models the treatment specific outcome surfaces. So that is the central reason why um, that. Um, proposition would hold um, hmm. asymptotically, asymptotically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, but there is also a theory showing that if we have um, equal randomization, um, ENCOVA2 will be equivalent to ENCOVA1, but this is more general, um, where we allow R to be an arbitrary number between 0 and D1. So um, that's kind of the essential reason why they're equivalent. Um, Asymptotically, basically by allowing G of Z, G Z of X to be a treatment specific outcome surface. And that comes from the expansion of the influence function when we use these weighting procedures. Okay, thanks, that makes sense. Thank you for the precision. Thanks. Um, so I will move on then um, before we um, have any questions. Um, so, so, so we um, proceed with some simulation studies to compare um, um, the, these approaches. We start from the continue from a continuous outcome where we generate 10 covariates from the um, standard normal distribution, and then we randomize the treatment indicator from a Bernoulli model where we allow the allocation proportion to be 
um, one half, but also deviates from one half to be 0.7. We simulate um, the potential outcome from a linear outcome surface um, where we specify the main effect of beta zero so that the signal to noise ratio is one, but with variant importance attached to components of the axis, some strong prognostic covariates, but some weak lead prognostic covariates. We also vary beta one um, to represent the level of the treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, we are interested in small to moderate um, randomized controlled trials mimicking the fast air, into, fast air RCT. And then we um, ran two, 2000 simulations to see, um, to, to compare the performance characteristics of a set of commonly used um, estimators, including the unadjusted estimator, the APW and OW estimator, where we consider linear specification of the covariates in the logistic working model. And then we also compare with the NCOVA2 estimator, which we denote by LR, stands for linear regression. And then we also compare with the augmented IPW estimator, where we hybrid IPW with regression, which is known as the usual doubly robust estimator in the observational, um, in, 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 in analyzed the observational studies, but applied to the RCT context. And for variance estimation, we proceed with um, the sandwich variance for IPW, OW, as well as the AIPW, which takes into account the estimation um, of the regression function as well as the inverse probability, um, as well as the propensity score model. And for linear regression, we proceed with um, the Huber White sandwich variance um, as recommended in the paper by Ling. Um, this, as, this variance is consistent even when the allocation proportion deviates from one half. Um, so under equal randomization, um, when we have a constant treatment effect, um, this figure shows the relative efficiency of IPW linear regression and, and IPW um, relative to the unadjusted estimator um, when we vary um, the level of the sample size. In this simple case, there is an efficiency ordering in a sense that OW seems to be the most efficient, um, followed by linear regression and then followed by IPW. And the advantages of the OW is um, very noticeable in, in, in small samples when n, when the sample size of RCT does not exceed 100, but when we increase the sample size to 200, um, all of the three estimators are um, approximately equally um, efficient, which matches um, the previous proposition one that we have studied analytically. We did not display the results from the AIPW estimator because in this context, um, it is almost behaving equally to the linear regression estimator, suggesting that the regression components dominates the weighting components in RCTs. Um, when we increase the level of um, heterogeneity of the treatment effect, when we, increase the in, um, when we increase the value of the interactions in our data generating process, we can see that the linear regression um, becomes um, slightly more efficient than OW and then followed by IPW in this, kind, in this, in this particular scenario. And then it is expected because we do have the correct outcome model specification. Um, and then the balanced design actually favors the linear regression in small samples. However, the advantage of the linear regression or in COVID-2 model decreases with reduced degree um, of the treatment effect heterogeneity. And then once we further increase the sample size to, to 400 or 500, all three estimators again are approximately equally efficient um, which matches our um, analytical prediction from proposition one, which shows that they are asymptotically equivalent. But in any case, we have seen that OW always performs better than IPW in the simulation studies under equal randomization. Um, so should I um, take care of the question now or, sh um, or should I proceed after? Because I saw there's a question from the um, chat. Um, I, I, so these questions are more related to the um, uh, what what happened before the theory. So maybe we can keep them for the end, uh, so we can continue Sounds good. the yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, so 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 we went ahead to do more simulations with unequal um, allocation proportion when r equals to 0.7. And um, for example, when we have a constant treatment effect um, scenario. Um, the left panel um, um, corresponds to a situation where we have the outcome model correctly specified. Um, in this case, we can see that when the sample size um, does not exceed 100, 
the linear regression estimator may even be less efficient than the unadjusted estimate, suggesting its instability in small samples when we have an unequal um, allocation proportion. Um, in this case, OW performs the best um, um, in, 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 in a range of um, samples as we considered. Uh, on, the right, on the right hand side, um, it corresponds to a scenario where we modify the data generating process by allowing for additional interactions between covariates, but that interactions is ignored um, in the uh, model feeding stage, in the outcome regression model, as well as in the propensity score model. And in this case, again, under a misspecified outcome model, we can see that there are situations where the linear regression model performs even worse than the unadjusted estimator. And the IPW could also possibly underperform the unadjusted estimator in some situations, but the OW estimate remains the most efficient and always perform um, better than the unadjusted estimators, showing that showing its promises in adjusting for covariates in randomized trials and also um, indicating its ability to protect to some degree um, model misspecification um, um, in, in RCTs. Um, for inference, um, we found that the coverage of the IPW estimator and OW estimator are close to nominal in, in most situations with the sandwich variance we worked with. However, the Huber White variance for the linear regression can be unstable in small samples and often be severely biased towards zero and showing under coverage. And this is most evident when we have an unbalanced allocation, um, when the outcome model is misspecified, or when we have a strong degree of heterogeneous treatment effect, which is ironic because that's when the linear regression gains the most efficiency, um, but the coverage can be poor if we proceed with a Huber White variant. Um, in any case, the AIW, the, the, the variance estimate for, AI, for AIPW is very similar to the performance of the variance of the of the linear regression because again, the regression components dominates the weighting component in this hybrid estimator. Um, for binary outcomes, we found that the covariate adjustment leads to efficiency improvement, likely when the sample size exceeds 100, um, except under strong heterogeneous treatment effect. And then in this particular case, correct outcome model can be more efficient than weighting um, in small samples only for common outcomes. But if we have a rare outcome, when the prevalence of the outcome reduces to 15%, we'll see that the performance of the regression-based approach starts to deteriorate in small samples. Um, in any case, the OW estimator um, always performed better than IPW in terms of efficiency. And then for inference in small samples, the sandwich variance for OW has the smallest finite sample biases um, but the Huber White variance for the logistic regression has the largest bias, um, even when we have a sample size over 100 in some scenarios. We then return to the application um, um, of, we, we then return to the motivating application um, of this research, the best of near interventions for research RCT, where we study the effect of continuous positive airway pressure treatment on the health outcomes of patients with obstructive um, sleep of near. Um, in, in the trial, we know that we do not have a large sample size. Um, uh, we have about only 83 or 86 individuals in the two treatment and control groups. And we are interested in um, two outcomes, the systolic blood pressure measured um, after baseline, as well as the Epworth slipiness scale um, that measures the daily slipiness. And we have a set of covariates to be considered in the trial, including um, patient demographics, as well as other um, health, um, 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 health information from the patients. And then this is the usual table one we see in a standard clinical paper. Um, as we um, explained earlier, um, randomization balances um, almost um, most of the covariates, but not all of them. And then specifically, if we calculate the um, absolute standardized differences um, without any adjustment, we can see that um, the baseline systolic blood pressure and the baseline apnea hypopnea index, the baseline AHI, um, signals large um, imbalance, large chance imbalance. And then this chance imbalance also carries to the BMI as well. If we use IPW, we can see that um, the resulting absolute standardized differences can be um, reduced to some degree so that we have approximate balance between the two groups, but 
once we use overlap weights, that um, imbalance vanishes to zero, which exemplifies the removal of the chance imbalance in the design stage before analyzing any outcomes. Um, we then apply um, all of the previously um, investigated estimators to analyzing the best error RCT. And in this case, um, the most, the, 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 the largest difference actually concerns um, the application of the unadjusted estimator versus the adjusted estimators um, because the covariate adjustment um, more or less returns very similar results in the single analysis. Um, in particular, for the systolic blood pressure outcome, um, if we proceed with the unadjusted estimator, we'll find a, a falsely um, significant results if we use the 0 0.5, 0 0.05 as our traditional cutoff. We'll see that um, you know, chance imbalance in the baseline covariates may lead to um, incorrect or doubtful um, um, conclusions with the unadjusted estimator in this single analysis. But after we adjust for covariates using any of the IPW, OW, or linear regression approaches, we would not see that effect if we use the traditional point of five as a cutoff. And that signals some differences um, in, in, in adjustment for covariates and um, can um, be an illustration of the consequences of ignoring the baseline imbalance um, in a single RCT. And so um, in, in this presentation, we, we demonstrate um, the balancing weights um, as a family of the weighting procedure can serve as an alternative way to adjust for covariates and improve, and, and, and improve precision in analyzing RCTs. We show that um, the weighting procedure um, in, in some conditions can be asymptotically equivalent to the efficient ANCOVA procedures and then justifies its application asymptotically. Um, but also we can also show, we, we, we have also shown that, that we can always do better in weighting than IPW by applying or switching to the OW procedure. On the other hand, though commonly used, regression may invite a fishing expedition and come with additional caveats. And specifically, the regression procedure can be unstable in small samples if we have a rare outcome um, or an unbalanced randomization. And uh, model misspecification can also decrease the efficiency of regression in a sense that we may um, have an estimator that is um, you know, even, even, even more inefficient than the unadjusted estimator. Um, and then there are some caveats also coming um, with the inference, um, um, with, with the application of the Huber White sandwich variance, which can be unstable in, in, in finite samples. So there is an increasing body of literature um, that um, studies overlap weights, not only in observational studies, but also in randomized trials as exemplified by our study. And so um, our reflection on overlap weights suggests that we can conceptualize a continuum of study designs for comparative effectiveness characterized by different degrees of overlap. For example, in observational studies um, with weak overlap, in this first figure, we can see that the densities of the two groups, um, the red curve as well as the green curve, are very different. And then OW will move the goalpost to gain efficiency over IPW for causal contrast by focusing on the population with the best equipoise, which is defined by this um, blue density over here in this first figure. But once we move to situations with better overlap, even by the second situation, we'll see that the densities of the two treatment and control groups will become more similar. And in this case, we can actually show that the average treatment effect among the overlap population will approximate ATE, but OW will be more efficient than IPW as well. In the limit, which we have perfect overlap and the two groups are comparable in expectation guaranteed by randomization, which is the case in our study, OW and, I, and, and IPW both estimate the target estimate ATE, but we still demonstrate that OW is more efficient than IPW um, in, in all of the cases we investigated. And there are some potential misconceptions um, on waiting, um, on applying waiting procedures to randomized control trials. For, for example, there is a recent simulation study suggesting that there is a superior coverage um, and efficiency property 
um, you know, by using linear regression versus IPW in, in small samples. But um, those simulations that is only considered the model-based variance, um, when the outcome regression model is correctly specified, and it further assumes equal allocation under which, cons under which case we would expect that the model-based variance is valid and is more stable than the Huber-White sandwich variance. However, the limitation that they found for IPW may be inherent to IPW, but not, on, but not for weighting in general, because we can make improvements possibly by using OW in, in randomized controlled trials. And then OW only requires a one line of change in the code compared to IPW. Um, and then it's pretty easy to carry out. In addition, um, even if the variance calculation is more involved, we have recently prepared an R package called PS weight to operationalize um, the variance calculation as well. And this new package not only can provide a pipeline for analyzing observational studies, it can also provide a tool for analyzing randomized controlled trials as we have um, um, shown in this presentation. Um, we're also currently thinking about applying this procedure to other um, study designs and other problems, which may be prone to chance imbalance, for example, um, subgroup analysis in randomized controlled trials often suffer from limited sample size and lower power. And so there is a chance for applying these new weighting procedures to gain efficiency in those limited sample sizes. Um, this weighting procedure, the OW, can also be applied to analyzing multi-arm randomized controlled trials for pairwise comparisons, adjusting for covariates, as well as cluster or group randomized trials, which often come with a limited number of clusters due to um, difficulties in engaging stakeholders from healthcare systems. And so um, these areas represent additional opportunities of applying these new weighting procedures for adjustment for covariates to improve efficiency. And so I'll stop here um, in case we have any questions. And um, I hope I'm still doing well in terms of time. Um, and um, um, any, any questions and comments are very welcome. Um, thank you, Fawn, for the uh, fantastic uh, presentation. I think probably in the interest of time, we should first uh, do go to the discussion. So, Sounds um, good. Sounds good. I'll stop sharing. So, Kara, yeah, maybe you can share your screen and start when you're ready. Can you see my screen okay? You good? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, hi, everyone. I am Carrie Locke Morgan from Penn State University. And I am very happy to have the opportunity to discuss what I think was just a really fantastic talk by Fawn that we all just heard. Um, so I wanted to start by thanking Fawn for a very um, wonderful talk and also for thanking all of the authors, which I think is kind of funny, includes the other fondly too, so I get a chuckle out of that. Um, but I think this was a really important um, piece of work that, that has a valuable place in the causal inference literature. So thank you to everyone involved. All right, so I am going to start by summarizing what I see as some of the key takeaways here and then giving some of my thoughts and perspectives on the topic. Um, so the first really important point kind of um, preceding all of this is the idea that covariates can be imbalanced even in experiments just by chance. And that's the motivation for all of this work. Regression or otherwise known as ANCOVA is a really popular way to adjust for this. But as Vaughn has just um, illuminated, there are cons involved with regression. Propensity score weighting is a nice alternative that I think avoids a lot of the problems typically associated with ANCOVA. And I think once we're ready to go down the road of propensity score weighting for covariate adjustment, I think we've seen a lot of compelling reasons for why the overlap weights um, really are superior in a lot of ways to the inverse probability weights that are more traditionally used. And this comes in part because of the, the better balance. I think the exact mean balance property is really so appealing, um, but also because that better balance does lead as well to greater precision. So those are kind of my high level takeaways. Um, let me dive into some of the more, more details and perspectives and thoughts here. All right, so let's um, situate this in the RCT that we're talking about. So we're talking about randomizing units to treatment groups, conducting the experiment, and analyzing the outcomes, and if needed, adjusting for imbalance. And this is kind of the flow that, that is very typical, probably the most common flow that researchers take when um, analyzing experiments or clinical trials. 
So I want to, first of all, commend this idea that we're talking about, um, that it's a really great first step to separate the imbalance adjustment from the outcome model. Fawn talked about this and I will as well, but I think um, separating as much as we can away from the analysis of the outcomes um, really goes a long way to improving objectivity of our causal estimates, or causal estimates, I should say. Um, so I think it's a great, a great step to separate the propensity score model from the outcome model. However, since we are in an experimental setting, I do, I feel remiss not to at least acknowledge that I don't think this is necessarily the best approach and I don't fault the authors at all because this is a little bit outside the scope of what they were talking about. Um, but I did wanna at least mention the idea that an even better approach would be to prevent this imbalance by design. So take the imbalance um, into the randomization phase or into the design phase, prevent imbalance from the get-go and then have a straightforward analysis of the outcomes from your experiment. Um, there are many ways to do this. That's not really the point here. You could use traditional blocking. I'll put in a shameless plug for my re-randomization method where you can re-randomize if you don't have acceptable balance. Um, but whatever method you choose, I think we should be thinking more about preventing imbalance as opposed to adjusting for it. That being said, no matter what we do here, there will be experiments that require adjustments. So that being said, um, let me move on now, assuming that we have an experiment with observed covariate imbalance, which is where I think um, Fawn and co-authors were, uses the starting point for, for all of their work. All right, so what do I see as advantage number one, first and foremost of the method that they proposed? Um, I see this as it's not specific to overlap weights yet, but really um, an advantage of propensity score weighting over ANCOVA. And that's this idea that you can, you can fit the propensity score model without any access to the outcomes. And Fawn mentioned that this is a way to, um, to stop the fishing expeditions, but I think even for really well-intentioned, ethical, honest researchers, we all have a, an inherent interest in the results if we're really invested in the study at hand. And it's really hard to make all the model decisions, all, all the necessary decisions that come with modeling if at every step of the way, we're also seeing the estimated treatment effect. Um, and I know there are alternatives. You can blind the, the treatment labels, which we can do be, be doing more of, but I think separating the, all the modeling decisions or all the analytic decisions from the outcomes is, is a really great way to be going in terms of objectivity. Um, so I think just based on this alone, propensity score weighting is really superior to ANCOVA, um, just based on this point alone. But of course, that's not the only advantage. All right, so advantage number two, I think has to do with modeling assumptions. So ANCOVA, um, like it or not, does come with associated modeling assumptions. And the authors pointed out, and, and I agree, that the ANCOVA estimate is consistent if you're in the superpopulation pre-randomization framework. And I think it's actually really quite impressive that it's consistent even under model misspecification. And this is a really, a really important point, and it, and it was touted a lot here. Um, but I do want to be very um, clear, I guess, as a way of saying this, is that it's consistent pre-randomization. So if you can assume that there's no relationship or that the treatment and the covariates are independent, which is true under randomization, but not true once you've observed a randomization and see that the covariates are in fact imbalanced. If the covariates are associated with the treatment, which they are if they're, there's imbalance there, um, then if the model is misspecified, you do have conditional bias. And I think that's an important point, we can't just see the model misspecification get, just get swept under the rug with randomized experiments, um, but it's really important to consider if the covariates are actually imbalanced. And this is especially important because we all know this famous quote, but all models are wrong and some are useful. We really, we know that our um, model is going to be misspecified to some extent. And maybe in a perfect simulation study, we can assume the correct outcome model, but in any real application, um, there is gonna be some degree of model misspecification. And I think having to caveat your causal estimate estimates with this notion that assuming the outcome, the relationship between the outcome and the covariates is correctly modeled is a really strong caveat that, that we'd rather not make given the choice. So that brings me to the propensity score model, which avoids the need to correctly model un this unknown relationship between the outcome and the covariates. But this is where I wanted to bring up a little <laughs> request for a clarification maybe, um, or, or help in my own understanding here, maybe misunderstanding. 
Um, so, the, so this is different than the observational study setting in that the true propensity score model here is known. It's a randomized experiment. It's not only known, but it's a constant and it's not dependent on the covariates. So, so, so Fawn mentioned, and this was in the paper as well, that um, we know the propensity score model, so it's always correctly specified. But I wanted to push back just a little there. So sorry, Fawn, but it seems to me that maybe it's always correctly misspecified because you're, you're specifying it as a function of the covariates that you know really aren't a part of the true model. Um, so I know that I know that they're doing the right thing, and I know we care about the correct observed. We know about sorry, we care about correcting observed imbalance, which the estimated propensity score captures, not the true propensity score. So we care about those estimated propensity scores, but I'm really kind of struggling with how how to grapple with this this idea that we're modeling something, but not really trying to model an underlying truth. Um, and what does that imply about the the underpinning assumptions? The results are likely still. In, in some sense model dependent, but it's not as clear as the ANCOVA setting um, what those modeling assumptions are, or what it even means to have a, have a correct model versus an incorrect model. Um, maybe there aren't any assumptions here, but that might be too good to be true. Um, if there are really no modeling assumptions, there's a, that's a clear advantage, um, but, but it seems like we can't take a bunch of assumptions and replace them with nothing. So I just wanted a little clarification there. And that brings us then to the overlap weights, kind of as a separate point. So, so I think the overlap weights, as opposed to inverse probability weights, I should say first and foremost with a, a big disclaimer. So I was one of the authors on the original overlap paper, weight paper. So I'm a little bit biased here, um, but I think that there's so many reasons why they're, they're, they really are superior to the inverse probability weights. Um, they give better, and by better, I mean exact mean balance, which I still find incredible to this day every time I see that. Um, and also better precision. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. This is maybe more relevant in observational studies, but if there is really severe imbalance, um, they also avoid those explosive weights you can see with the IPW weights. Um, so I should back up and say in observational studies, really the only thing I think stopping from everyone just immediately jumping on the overlay, overlap weight bandwagon is this idea that it does change the target population. And I think in most settings that's worth it, um, but it is a conscious decision you have to make. But I think it's really fascinating here that in, ex in experiments, you're not actually changing the target population. The propensity score is a constant. So weighting by any function of the propensity score is exactly equivalent. So whether you want to use overlap weights or inverse probability weights, you're working with the same target population, which to me seems like a no brainer that, that we should all be moving in the direction of, of overlap weights. I'm still a little fuzzy here on this idea that the true propensity scores are a constant, the estimated ones do depend on the covariates, but I think that's just me needing to digest that a little more. Um, regardless, I think these the overlap weights really have a clear advantage over the inverse probability weights. So to summarize, I think in my mind from what I've seen, um, the overlap weights I think are superior to the inverse probability weights, and I think propensity score weighting in general is superior to ANCOVA for covariate adjustment. Um, the propensity score weighting over ANCOVA has the clear benefit of improving objectivity while also reducing the reliance on model assumptions. Whereas the overlap weights over the inverse probability weights have that exact mean balance property and also the better precision property. I do want to point out that I think all of these advantages become much more pronounced with worse balance. So in the perfect balance situation, they're all basically equivalent, at least in terms of point estimates. Um, whereas in observational studies, I don't think any of us would consider using ANCOVA as a good method for causal inference. Um, and I think, especially in observational studies, the overlap weights um, get rid of that, those really explosive um, weights in the tails with the inverse probability weights suffer from. Um, and I just wanted to close by saying a reminder that, that for experiments, all of these are inferior to balancing by design. So we should all be doing that um, whenever possible and using this as kind of a, a second resort. Okay, thank you to all of you and to, to Fawn for a fantastic talk. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, uh, Carrie, for the great discussion. Um, Fan, do you want to uh, respond? Um, totally, yeah. So thank you so much, Carrie, for your um, really nice discussion. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I could, in the interest of time, I could respond to two points really quickly. Yeah. Um, and then the first one is I want to say that um, it, it's really important to consider balancing by design using either blocking, um, certification, um, as well as um, 
um, restrictive randomization, such as re-randomization. Um, but I think in those cases, it's um, still possible also to use the overlap weights um, in the analysis stage to gain additional um, efficiency and, re and remove any potential residual balance. So I think the applicability of this weighting procedure is universal. Um, um, is is universal, but we should do a better job in the design stage because there is no analysis that can save from save us from a poor design. So I completely agree with that. And then the second point is that um, whether regarding whether there is any assumptions on the propensity for weighting in randomized control trials, I think this point is really worth discussing because asymptotically, if we believe that the assignment does not depend on any covariates, and so all of the coefficients in that logistic working model is basically an unbiased estimator of zeros, right? Um, because we are estimating, for example, a true probability of one half that is irrespective of any covariates. But what the propensity for weighting has been doing is that it exploits the chance imbalance. And then by estimating the betas in that logistic working model, somehow it exploits, it, it has an, an induced outcome regression, just like ENCOVA. And, and this is more, um, maybe more evident if we put all of these estimators into the family of the estimators, even in this slide, which I think I have mentioned um, again and again, is that um, once we do weighting, we'll see that asymptotically that amounts to choosing these augmentation terms, G0X and G1X, as the conditional expectation of Y, even Z, and Xs, which is implicitly equal to ENCOVA. So we are, even though we're not directly estimating an outcome function um, in the analysis stage, but somehow by exploiting the structure of the logistic working propensity score model, we are implicitly um, talking about exploiting the relationship between the axis as well as the outcome. So it's an indirect route um, to where we want to get and it avoids potential problems with directly um, you know, applying outcome regression. So I would say that there is very little assumption going into the propensity score model um, stage. Um, and, and what we are doing is to really exploit the fact that we have imbalance and then use that to inform an implicit outcome regression model, which in the end, asymptotically, is going to be identical to the ANCOVA models, uh, whether for IPW or for OW. But in, in small samples, OW seems to be a lot more superior than IPW. So that's um, the reason um, why we are advocating a change um, in the practice for randomness control. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fawn. So I think we should probably uh, finish up now. Sounds good. So, um, so yeah, um, let me share my screen. And I apologize if I haven't answered all the questions in the chat, <laughs> um, um, but um, I, I would be happy to take any questions after um, words as well by email. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, thank you to uh, uh, Fawn and, and Kerry for uh, the great presentations and to uh, Fawn and Shushi for uh, helping with Q&A. Uh, next week, we're gonna have uh, Vanessa Didelez from the University of Bremen tell us about causal reasoning in survival and time to event analyses, uh, and our discussant will be Els uh, Gottgebauer from uh, Ghent University. Uh, we're very much looking forward to that talk, and uh, we hope you'll join us. So thank you. Hi, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Happy Hi, everyone. Great talk. Thank you.